The Bible. It's one of the most influential books in human history. It explores the big questions of why we exist. It's inspired many people to do amazing things. And confused many others. And you've probably got one sitting around somewhere. So, what is the Bible actually? Well, the Bible is a small library of books that all emerged out of the history of the people of ancient Israel. And in one sense, they were just like any other ancient civilization. But among them were a long line of individuals called prophets. And they viewed Israel's story as anything but ordinary. They saw it as a central part of what God was doing for all humanity. And these prophets were literary geniuses. Really? Yeah, they expertly crafted the Hebrew language to write epic narratives, very sophisticated poetry. They were masters of metaphor and storytelling, and they leveraged all of this to explore life's most complicated questions about death and life and the human struggle. So there's a lot of different authors writing this book. Yeah, and these texts were produced over a thousand year period, starting with Israel's origins in Egypt then leading up to their kingdom with their first temple. But eventually, they were conquered by the Babylonians, who took them away into exile. Then, at a crucial moment in their history, many Israelites returned to their land. They built a second temple, they reformed their identity, and this is when the Jewish scriptures began to be formed into the shape that we have them today. Okay, the Jewish Bible. What's in it? Well, in Hebrew, it's called by an acronym, Tanakh. The T stands for Torah, sometimes called the Law. That's Israel's five-book foundation story. The N stands for Nevi'im, the Hebrew word for prophets. And this section consists of the historical books that tell Israel's story from the prophet's point of view. Then you get the poetic books of the prophets themselves. The K stands for Ketavim, the Hebrew word for writings. This is a diverse collection of poetic books, wisdom books, and more narrative. And the Jewish people believe that through all of these literary works, God speaks to his people. Now, there were other Jewish writings being produced during this Second Temple period as well. Yeah, a really diverse group of texts. And these two were highly valued in Jewish communities. And there was debate from ancient times about whether or not some of these should be considered part of their scriptures. So this is a lot of different writings over a long period of time. Why did they put them all together like this? Well, altogether, these texts tell an epic story about how God is working through these people to bring order and beauty out of the chaos of our world. And it all builds up to a hope for a new leader who would come and renew all creation. And then the Tanakh concludes, and this leader never comes. So it's an expertly crafted work, but it's missing an ending? That's exactly right. Now, a few centuries later, a Jewish prophet comes onto the scene named Jesus of Nazareth. He claimed he was carrying the Tanakh story forward. Yeah, so Jesus did a bunch of cool stuff was killed, but his followers claimed he was alive from the dead. Yeah, they said that Jesus was that long-awaited leader who would restore the world. And so his earliest followers, called apostles, they composed new literary works about the story of Jesus. They called these good news or the gospel. They formed an account called Acts about the spread of the Jesus movement outside of Israel. And then they circulated letters to different Jesus communities all around the ancient world. And they saw these writings as part of the scripture. Yeah, the apostles wrote all of this as the fulfillment of that epic story found in the Tanakh. And they were continuing the literary genius of the Jewish tradition. They also believed that God was speaking to his people through these texts alongside the scriptures of Israel. So that's the Old and New Testament. But what did the early Christians think of the other Second Temple literature? Well, different groups had different views about some of these books, but we know they read them and valued these texts because they passed them along with the Jewish scriptures. Okay, so we've got the Tanakh, the Jewish scriptures. We've got these other Second Temple period works. Then the writing of the apostles about Jesus. And that's a lot of literature, so what's in my Bible? So the Christian movement has taken different forms over 2,000 years, and from the beginning, all Christians recognized the Tanakh and the New Testament as scripture. And for centuries, much of the Second Temple literature was read as part of the biblical tradition. The Catholic Church eventually made it official and called some of the books from this collection the Deuterocanonical books. Some Orthodox churches used even more books from this Second Temple literature. And then in the 1500s, during the Reformation, Protestant Christians wanted to go back to the oldest writings of the prophets and apostles, so they accepted only the Old and New Testaments. Okay, I think I got it. But how does a collection of books produced over a thousand years by all these different authors tell one unified story? Yeah, that's the question we'll address in our next video.
Hey, I'm John. And I'm Tim. This is The Bible Project. We believe the Bible is a unified story that leads to Jesus and has profound wisdom for the modern world. So we're creating videos to show that. This was the first in a brand new series that we're starting, How to Read the Bible, but uh, we have lots of other kinds of videos. You can find it all for free on our website at jointhebibleproject.com. In fact, there you can find a handout that will accompany this video. It just goes into more detail in the information that this video was about and lots of other resources, so check it out. You could also be a part of this by supporting us at thebibleproject.com. Our goal is to make all these resources available for free to anybody, anywhere, and we can do that because of your support. So thanks so much, you guys. Thanks. Muhammad Adib had lost his sheep, and he didn't know where to find them. Or at least that's the story that was told afterward. Perhaps the 16-year-old shepherd really was looking for sheep or goats when he tumbled into that desert cave. Or maybe he was looking for ancient tombs that contained valuable artifacts. According to a local legend, Muhammad tossed a rock into a cave hoping to find a lost sheep. But what Muhammad heard instead when he tossed his rock wasn't the bleating of a sheep or a goat. What he heard instead was the shattering of pottery. And what he found in the broken jars in that cave would impact the world long after his wayward flock was forgotten. What Muhammad found in the winter of 1946 and 1947 were the first of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Before it was all over, more than 900 ancient documents were discovered, hidden in caves in the region known today as the West Bank. And where did these documents come from? Well, they seem to have been the library of a Jewish sect that had withdrawn to an isolated desert community known as Qumran. Around 220 of the Dead Sea Scrolls are fragments, or scrolls, of books from the Hebrew and Aramaic Old Testament. Some of these documents were preserved in jars, others were quickly buried in the cave floor. So why were the scrolls buried so quickly and then abandoned? Well, in the year 68 AD, the Romans had invaded Judea to crush a rebellion that had started two years earlier. It's possible that the Jewish community in Qumran hid their scrolls quickly before the Romans arrived, hoping to retrieve them later. But then in the year 70, Jerusalem was destroyed. Qumran was turned into a garrison for Roman troops, and the Jewish community never returned. And so the scrolls remained hidden for nearly 2,000 years. When the Dead Sea Scrolls were rediscovered in the 20th century, it became clear that the text of the Old Testament had remained remarkably stable over the centuries. In fact, a scroll of Isaiah found among the Dead Sea Scrolls was copied more than a hundred years before Jesus was even born. Yet the wording of this scroll of Isaiah agrees in almost every detail with the Masoretic texts that were copied a thousand years later. Over the course of a millennium of hand copying, the text of Isaiah had remained virtually unchanged. Now, in some other Old Testament texts, the Dead Sea Scrolls did reveal a variety of versions and some copying variations. But none of these variations has any effect on anything that we believe about God or about his work with the world. What the Dead Sea Scrolls have demonstrated is that God's word in the Old Testament did not change radically in the centuries after these texts were gathered together. Instead, over the course of hundreds of years, the books of the Old Testament were copied and they were preserved with amazing accuracy.